can hear it. There we go. Okay, well, Dr. Marks, um, thank you for being with us today. Really excited to have you. Um, I'll let you go ahead and take it away. All right, sounds good. Hi, everybody. Whatever time zone you're in, I'm coming to you from Chicago tonight. And I'm really excited to for this inaugural webinar within the clubhouse um, of five things that I think are really telltale signs on is my dog happy. So just a quick little background on me. I'm a practicing veterinarian. It's my 21st year of practice. This is my son. I have three kids uh, and my dog, Samantha. So I have just like you, many of the same concerns every day when I wake up and I go to get my unconditional love from Samantha, I have worries, right? Of, you know, is her day going to go great? Did anything happen? Does she feel okay? Is she, you know, is she really engaged in life when she's off by herself on a couch? You know, how is she feeling? And so these are questions that even veterinarians have. So I want to hopefully enlighten us tonight on some of the things that are going to really help you understand what your dog is trying to say to you through different body language and different postures, and also things that we can watch for and add to our house to really give our dogs the best quality of life that we want them to have, because of course they give that back to us every single day. So before we go any further, um, and Kristen, I may need your help with this a little bit because I can't see everybody since I'm presenting. Just a couple quick questions for everyone tonight, just to sort of see. You can either physically raise your hand if you're on screen or in your um, toolbar, there's an area for you with emotions to put the little raise hand section. I'd love to just get a sense from everyone if you feel like your dog um, is always happy. Like every day, do you feel like your dog wakes up and is just rearing to go and feels amazing and you have no concerns. So if you do, put your hand up, raise your hand or put it in, um, in your picture within the Zoom. If you don't, keep it down. And I'd love to get a sense from people. And Kristen, I'll have, like I said, have to have you kind of give me a little bit of gauge from everyone who's on camera, what they're thinking. You bet. I don't see anyone raising their hand yet. <laughs> And I would say that's pretty normal because I, I think it's a very common concern that I get from a lot of my clients who come in and say, you know, I'm concerned my dog's depressed. I'm concerned that my dog doesn't like my new baby in the house. I'm concerned my dog hates my cat. I'm concerned my dog hates my new partner. <laughs> I think that my dog hates me sometimes, whatever it might be. It's really, really common. So that leads me to think that many of you are going to raise your hand and worry my dog isn't as happy as I would like to see him or her. And I will raise my hand here because there are days where I think that where I'm working, you know, 14 hours at the clinic and I don't think that my kids have walked her and maybe I haven't given her enough enrichment during the day and I see a lot of hands coming up. So I'm so glad that we're on this topic because hopefully you'll walk away from here in the next 30, 45 minutes with some really easy strategies on how to look at your dog in your home and maybe your dog's sitting right next to you and to understand what your dog is trying to tell you and also what you can do to maybe add a little bit more happiness every single day. So let's start with the task number one. First and foremost, we have to understand dogs are talking to us every single day, just not in the way that we talk, right? It's always through their body language. And I will tell you that it took a very long time for me as a veterinarian to really even understand all the different nuances and little subtleties that dogs try to tell us through their postures. Um, this is really relatively new in the last five years in veterinary medicine. So don't feel like you've been in the dark. We, we've all been in the dark, but now we have some really great tips on how to see what your dog is telling you. So this dog right here, is kind of a textbook appearance of a happy dog. So we have very relaxed ears. We'll talk about eye position in a minute. Tail is up, they look confident and happy and probably out for a walk or you know on their property and feeling great. The thing is, is that not every dog shows this all the time, especially the dogs that I see who are coming into veterinary practices or in my neighborhood um, on leash or at dog parks or wherever you might be socializing your dog. So let's go over a couple really important kind of distinguishing factors between a relaxed dog and we would code that a happy dog. So a dog that's feeling really comfortable in their environment versus a stressed dog. Oop, forgive me. So we're gonna start with the relaxed dog. Very, very um, desirable <laughs> kind, kind of look to this dog. 
we have a, a mouth that's open and relaxed and the lips we call long and soft. So basically it looks like they're smiling a lot of times. Their ears are forward. We know that dogs' ears are incredibly sensitive, not just to hearing, but also to emotion. So their ears are gonna be forward, not to the side or back. Their face looks relaxed, just like ours. We don't have a tense grimace. The pupils are normal size. And a lot of people say to me, a lot of my clients will be like, Dr. Marks, there's no way I can tell pupil size. I agree with you, unless you're right in their face. It's not easy to see this, but if you're at home and your dog is sitting on the couch and is scared of thunderstorms, you might be able to see that pretty quickly because they're fearful or stressed. There's also a flexible neck to tail. So you can see, it looks like that dog's kind of loosey goosey and the tail is very relaxed, what we call it the top line. So that's where if the body is here and the tail is here, it goes all the way down and the tail might be up or just very relaxed and wagging back and forth. That's a very relaxed dog. And you can look at your dog right now, if you're next to them and get a sense, is, is my dog relaxed? It looks like Chrissy's looking at her dog. Take a very relaxed pose there. Um, again, ears are probably the first place that I look to see if a dog is relaxed. I look at tail placement and I also just look at their mouths. Those are three quick ways to say this dog is approachable, this dog is happy, this dog is very comfortable and confident in their surroundings. Now, on the flip side though, we do see, especially today, a lot of stressed dogs. You can see a very big difference here. These are dogs that have very dilated pupils. In other words, you're, they're just gonna look like black balls essentially as eyeballs. A very tense face, you can see this Cocker Spaniel has sort of that grimace, that that furrowed or wrinkled brow, the kind of wrinkled lip curl. A lot of times you'll see even that lip curl up in a dog that's becoming from stressed to more reactive, meaning they're almost getting defensive. Their tail will be down and tucked, not talking like a German shepherd who carries their tail down all the time, but you see this dog is trying to make himself smaller and the body is crouching lower to the ground. So these are very important cues to us as pet parents to understand when, num number one, how my dog is feeling, but number two, should I interact with my dog right now? If my dog looked like the dog at the bottom, this would not be a dog I would instantly take to a communal dog park or to a festival or a dog cafe because something's bothering them. And that's sort of the detective work that we do at home. First is identifying though when they feel good and when they don't. So right now, I think there's probably a few things that everybody can it pretty quickly point out on this dog that this is a dog that is not happy, right? So we can start at the top. The ears are not forward and up. They're to the side and kind of pointing back. The pupils are slightly dilated. Again, I don't really go by that, but look at that furrowed brow and the lip curl. This is a dog that I would not approach right away. I would let some time and, and space come between that dog, especially if you're listening right now and you're a parent of kids or you have nieces or nephews or other children that come over to the home who aren't going to be as keen on reading dog body language, this is a dog that could potentially have an increased risk of a bad interaction with that child, especially if they're going for the same toy or something else is triggering them. So body language is so important in telling us if our dog feels, again, happy slash confident slash comfortable versus this dog who is showing us signs of being fearful, stressed, or anxious. What I wanna point out really quickly on the body language though is also yawning. So a big misconception that we've all had, including myself for a very long time, is that dogs yawn because they're tired or they yawn because they need to get oxygen just like we do and um, they've had a big workout or they've been running around, but dogs yawn because they're stressed. And so if you notice, and if, let's say you're looking at your dog right now, if your dog is yawning repetitively, your dog is stressed about something. It has really very little to do with how tired they are or not. And so that is a great indication, especially if, if after tonight you're watching your dog the next few days and you're like, my gosh, like every time the mailman comes, my dog yawns. Or every time I go in the car, my dog is yawning. Those are really great tips to start talking about with your veterinarian or your care coach or understanding that dog's behavior so we can figure out what is triggering them to be stressed. The second thing that we look for to see if our dog is happy is to look for signs of pain. This is tricky sometimes because dogs do not show signs of pain like we do. Now, for instance, 
if your dog looked like this, and many of you might be going, what is wrong with that dog? So this is a dog that got into a porcupine fight. And these are all porcupine quills that are stuck in this dog's muzzle, right? I think we could probably all agree. This is probably a dog who has some pain. I, I, I would have pain. This dog is not acting overtly like it's painful, but we can probably agree it's, it's painful. Now, the same may not be as evident for this dog, right? Who's hiding under the blankets. So is this dog painful? Is this dog scared? Is this dog anxious? Is this dog all of the above? Well, dogs, just like their body language is telling us things about happiness, their body language and other behaviors are telling us if they don't feel good in regards to pain. Um, so feel free if you wanna screenshot this, if that'll help you. We, you know, it's a lot to remember, but I wanna point out a few things that I, I think are um, lesser known signs of pain in your dog and also ones that people have really never associated with pain because we're finding more and more that these are. One of the first ones is actually licking. So a lot of people at home will come in to see me and say, you know, I'm so frustrated. My dog all night is doing this. And they've got this big wet spot on my couch or my bed and I wake up and my dog's paws are soaked and I'm like, why, why is my dog licking? Well, licking can be a sign of allergies, but it actually is also a sign of pain. So sometimes that means your dog has arthritis. Sometimes it means that their pads hurt. Sometimes it means their mouth hurts but it can be a sign of pain, especially if it's repetitively at one spot. Um, grooming is another big indicator of pain. So what I mean by that is dogs and cats too will only bathe themselves if they feel good enough to do it. So it's called an accessory behavior. They only do it when they have enough energy to do so because innately, if they do that and they're in the wild, they're making themselves vulnerable. So if your dog has always had this gorgeous hair coat, really shiny and healthy, and all of a sudden is starting to have sort of a dull flaky coat and is shedding excessively, that a lot of times can be indicative of pain. Um, and it's really important to talk to a veterinarian or care coach about that. Changes in behavior. If your dog has been this love muffin of smush that you just cling to constantly and is always next to you, you know, watching The Bachelorette or whatever it is that you do at night. And now all of a sudden your dog is reclusive and staying in another room or is growling when you take a toy away. Those can be indicators of pain. Things that also have really what we think of nothing to do with something painful can be signs of pain, like having accidents in the house, urinating or defecating in the house. Even though that to, to you might be like, oh, why is my dog, you know, my dog's house broken. Why is he doing that? It actually is them trying to tell us something doesn't feel good. We may not immediately know what that is, right? I mean, the porcupine quills is a pretty obvious flashlight as to where that dog's painful, but this may be that that dog has bladder stones or feels constipated or has some kind of belly pain. So those are things to remember. We can't always assume that dogs are going to vocalize when they're in pain. In fact, it's very, very rare that they actually do that, except in an immediate painful episode. Um, if they tear a ligament or they get hit by something, just like us, they don't continually vocalize. Dogs are incredibly stoic. And so we have to look for some of these other signs of pain to make sure that we're not missing them. The third thing that helps to make sure that our dogs are happy is that every day we give them some kind of exercise, even if you have a very, very lazy English bulldog who loves to live on their little pet cot at home. Um, even English bulldogs can exercise. The key is, is how do we encourage that exercise so that it is safe for them and for their health and for their age and for what they can do? Because this dog here is not going to be doing the same kind of exercise as this dog who probably goes to a park and knows the term B-A-L-L, -L, even when you spell it, and will go for eight hours at a time until you're too tired to throw the ball and they still want to go, right? Very, very different. Exercise, though, is not just for their physical health. As we know in humans, there is so much mental health benefit from physical exercise, and it's the same for our dogs. Especially want to point out that there's a very big difference in breed. So brachy at the top here, the dog group, brachycephalic dogs is a fancy term for smushed face dogs. English Bulldogs and Pugs and Boston Terriers and Lhasa Apsas and all those dogs that really have no nose at all. 
those are dogs that anatomically have a harder time breathing. So it would not be a dog that I would say, you've got an overweight bulldog, let's go train for a 5K tomorrow. Absolutely not. We're going to put those dogs at risk. But that doesn't mean that they can't run up and down your hallway after a treat or do a bit of tug or go for a nice controlled leash walk when it's not humid out, like at dusk and dawn. Versus if we go all the way down this chart to the herding breeds, so these are dogs like Australian Shepherds and Border Collies and Cattle Dogs. These are dogs that work for a living and are really, really unhappy if they don't have a job. So for us, me living downtown Chicago, if I had one of these herding dogs, I would have to really alter my lifestyle a little bit to make sure that they had that kind of job every day. So a lot of people here will get dog runners and take those dogs for a five mile run every day because they need that for their sanity or joining things like agility groups or nose work groups or some of the really fun dog community groups that are out there that your dog can, again, have a job to do. So if you have a herder, you can see how much they really need every day for them to stay mentally healthy and then all in between. And certainly this is, you know, a generalization. You might have a herding dog that loves to be a couch potato and maybe that's the anomaly. Um, but this is sort of a good place to start. And again, talking to your veterinarian or care coach about really any nuances that if your dog just recovered from cruciate surgery or just had hip surgery or something like that, we wanna ease them into it appropriately. But just sort of giving you a sense of how much exercise really these dog breeds need. Now. Feeding the soul. Um, here's a, a very interesting part that I think human medicine has finally really embraced is that we truly are what we eat and so are our dogs. So we have to think about when we are feeding our dogs, what kind of food are we giving them? Now, in the world today, there are over 4,000 types of dog foods, <laughs> literally between different brands and different types and kibble shapes and lifestyle changes and all different types of proteins, there are thousands of foods out there to choose from. And it's a very common question that I get is, which food is right for my dog? I wish there was a black and white answer and I could just tell you tonight, this is the food, but it's very individualized to your dog, to your dog's health status, their mouth shape, um, their age, their breed, a lot of things go into that. But it's not like there's only one option and everything else is bad. There's usually several different options that we have out there to make sure that they're getting good quality nutrition that's balanced for dogs. Now, one myth that's out there is that dogs are carnivores and they need to eat like cats and just eat protein all the time. That's absolutely not true. Dogs are omnivores, which means they have a mixture of carbohydrates and proteins that they need and a small amount of fat. And so that's really important that we don't want to be giving dogs cat food just because it's easy and down and they share a house with a cat. An occasional bite is fine. But we also, again, we want to make sure that it's appropriate to their species. The other thing to remember is we want to be giving safe and healthy treats. And treats should never be more than 10% of their regular diet. So when we think about that, that's a really good way, of course, to make sure that we're maintaining appropriate weight for our dogs. The other thing to think about is when we're feeding, especially if we have those herding dogs or terriers or some of these dogs where we know their brain is just going a mile a minute, puzzle feeders are great ways to keep them engaged. So putting food down, this is an example, this is Lucy. Um, this is an example of a puzzle feeder where she has to figure out how to move these shapes to uncover and reveal kibble. And it's a really nice way to get them physical exercise, mental exercise, have them work for their food. And then you can eventually work up to some of the even more challenging puzzle feeders. For dogs that are the snarfers, so as an example, I used to have a lab named Jimmy where I would put his food down, I'd turn around, wash my hands, and I'd look down and the entire bowl would be gone, including the bowl itself. He would just literally inhale it all. And these are dogs that are prone to getting bloat and lots of other GI problems, some of which could be life-threatening. These are great opportunities to do more slow controlled feeding. It's much healthier for dogs to eat this way than to just sort of vacuum all their food up in one big bite. The other thing that that really good nutrition does is help us maintain body weight. 
this is just a very easy example. And if your dog is next to you right now, it's a great time to assess their body condition. You can look from the top and you can look from the side. And essentially we wanna look for three things that tell us that our dog is at appropriate weight for their frame. We don't go by the number on the scale because that's very different compared to a, a Chihuahua versus a Great Dane. Of course, frames are very different. We go by how their body weight sits on their own body. So if you're looking at your dog from the top, you see at the top, you wanna have that nice hourglass figure, a nice cut in after the rib, and it goes out a little bit more at the hips. If you're looking from the side, you see that nice abdominal tuck up from their rib cage. And if you're feeling your dog right now, you wanna make sure that you can feel the ribs, but not see them. Those are the three great characteristics to make sure that our dogs are a very healthy weight. And that's of course, incredibly important to the longevity. All of the studies that have been done looking at dogs' weights have shown that the leaner they are, the longer they live. In fact, a really lot, what we call a lifetime study following dogs from the time they were puppies all the way until they were 12 to 14 years of age found that dogs that were kept at a healthier weight lived three years longer than dogs that weren't, that, had, um, that were either overweight or considered clinically obese. So to me, that's one of the first things that I look at and talk about with pet parents is making sure that we understand what does your dog look like at a healthy weight and let's try to keep it there as, as long as possible. And then finally, I've been kind of alluding to this a little bit along the way, but the enrichment. When we talk about dog's happiness, there's three things, really categories that we're looking at. We're thinking about their physical health, their mental health, and their emotional health. And the enrich enrichment, so doing things that really encourage them to use all parts of their body, targets all three parts of those components of health. So you might have a dog that just craves the water. Um, my dog, Jimmy, he literally, I, I had to physically pull him out of oceans and ponds and lakes and puddles and anything else because he was a swimmer and that was his happy spot. And so we would do all kinds of things to make sure that as often as possible, we could bring him to his happy spot. He would exercise, he'd be mentally healthy. We'd watch his body language and understand that that's where he found joy. That's not for every dog, but enrichment is, doesn't have to be out at the ocean or at, at the beach. Enrichment can be as simple as you interacting with your dog at home with their favorite toy. Something like this where we're doing tug. Now, one thing to say about tug is we don't wanna introduce tug of war where it's you against your dog until at least six months of age. When we do that as puppies, we actually can increase their dominance behavior and increase their risk of becoming what's called reactive. That's the newer term for aggressive, meaning growling, um, what we call resource guarding. So fighting over having a toy or food removed, we actually see that link with dogs that are taught tug at a very early age. That doesn't mean you can't use a rope toy in a puppy. In fact, a great tip is to soak a rope toy in chicken broth or cold water, put it in the freezer, and then give that to your dog as a teether. They really will enjoy that for periods of time, and it's a good way to have enrichment when you need a break because we can't be and shouldn't be around our dogs 24-7. They need separation too. But another great way to enrich them is through Kong toys. And if you've used a Kong toy, it's very popular, of course, around puppies um, and all dogs for that matter. They're hollow in the center and I put anything in there from peanut butter and cream cheese and Cool Whip and frozen yogurt and all kinds of stuff that dogs like, even cottage cheese. And you can freeze this and then give that to them when you're getting ready to leave, when they're going in the crate. It's a really great way to associate a positive reward with something that they may not see as positive. Again, separation from you, but also letting them have some enrichment and something to chew on and to work on. So speaking of Kong, um, I'm gonna turn this over to Kristen and we'll, I'll be staying around here for questions, but I think we have a really fun giveaway for those of you that have joined tonight. Yes, thank you, Dr. Marks. That was great. I wrote this in the chat, but I never knew about that the the age of which tug of war is introduced could impact like long-term behaviors that's so crazy to me yeah and i don't think many people do and mm -hmm. i i will take take it for the team for veterinarians we have not done a great job of really communicating that and with so many new puppies out there we really want to make sure we start them off on the right paw forward right <laughs> that tug of war can absolutely be done 
but it not only creates that dominant tendency, remember those puppies are teething and those baby teeth are not very strong. I've seen a lot of dogs fracture their puppy teeth and we actually have to go in and surgically remove them or it becomes painful and their gums are bleeding. It's just not a great um, zero to six month play toy, but after six months, tug away. <laughs> That's great. Okay. So Speaking of um, enrichment, like uh, Dr. Mark said, we do have a giveaway that we're going to do during the webinar today. Um, I did draw randomly a winner, and so I'm going to announce that in just a moment. But for anyone who doesn't win, we will still have an opportunity for you to enter. Um, I'm going to put a link in the chat here momentarily that you can go to. Uh, fill out. It's just a couple of quick questions. We just want a little information from you, whether you like the webinar, what you felt like, you know, you could have gone deeper on um, that you'd like more information about that kind of thing. And um, every, if the more, the information, if you go and submit um, that info, you'll be entered for another drawing. So um, to get to the winner, uh, Tracy Romano, I see you on the call. I don't see your video and that's okay. Um, but you are our winner. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> hey, Tracy. <laughs> okay, so I'm Tracy. I'm going to send you a message in um, the chat on Zoom, and I'm going to just send you uh, my email. Would you send me an email while we're on the call right now? Sure. Awesome. Okay. I just sent that to you. Okay, okay nice. perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> yes, congrats. We're excited you're here. So thank you everyone for joining. Um, one more thing uh, that I want to touch on, uh, Natalie's got this up on the screen right now. Uh, we do, if you haven't heard of the Aspet app, I know I see a few members on here, so glad you're here. Um, and if you haven't heard of, you know, all of the things that we offer, I just want to talk through that real quick um, through Aspet, the app's available in the App Store, um, both Android and Apple. Um, we have a few things in here uh, as far as what benefits that you get for becoming a member. Um, one of them, like uh, Dr. Marks alluded to, is you can talk to your care coach. Um, we have a few care coaches on the team who are on the call today. Uh, Georgia's one, you see her on video. You wanna wave at everyone, Georgia? <laughs> um, Georgia has been uh, really great with um, a lot of our members and setting up plans for them. Specific to their pet, we've had a lot of questions lately about separation anxiety and some showing some of these behaviors that Dr. Marks was talking about today and um, has been had a really big impact on uh, pet parents and their pets and the family as a whole. So um, you get care coaching from Georgia, you can get a personalized uh, pet plan as well. Um, we also have 24 seven veterinarian support. So any questions you have any time of the day, uh, you can log in and chat with a vet um, and get your questions answered. Additionally, um, we also have the rainy day fund. Uh, rainy day fund will cover you up to thousand dollars at any given point in time. It accrues over, you know, about two years roughly. Um, but anytime you use it, it will start from zero and start accruing back to a thousand again. Um, you get a free membership to Pet Care RX, so you can get discounts on um, prescriptions and pet food and whatnot. Um, and we also send you a welcome gift uh, where you'll get some diagnostics and labs for your pet and some treats too and toys. And then of course, we also have our community, our clubhouse um, that we just launched a few weeks ago and you'll get access to events like this um, for being a member as well. Um, you also, uh, Carolyn, I saw you post about uh, multiple pets. Um, just wanted to, to follow up on that. You only pay once uh, a month for multiple pets and you can get many personalized pet plans. You can talk to, you can add as many pets as you want in the app. Um, you also, your rainy day fund will cover any one of your pets if you talk to one of our vets as well. So if, if you have questions, you can um, reach out to carecoach at ask.vet um, and I'll put that in the um, chat as well. Uh, we'd love to talk to you if you have, you know, any questions about membership or how to get the most of your existing membership, um, we can chat there. So the link to the drawing, I just posted to everyone as well, the second drawing, um, feel free to go there and fill out some information. 
and um, hopefully we can get you another Kong Choi. So Tracy, we'll be in touch and we'll get you one for your little pepper. If I can just jump in, Kristen, it looks like Jessica did have a question. I wanna make sure we answer. Thank you. Um, and her question was, what if your pup isn't superfood motivated? Mine tries a puzzle for a bit and decides it's not worth it. Such a common question, Jessica, you're not alone at all. Um, you know, as a veterinarian, I will tell you, we always start with plan A, but we have plan B, C, D, E, sometimes F up our sleeves because every pet is different. Every pet, every dog is an individual personality. They have certain textures and tastes and preferences and temperatures that they like um, and don't like. So what I would say is this twofold. Um, some dogs are truly not food motivated. Basenjis are not food motivated. Shiba Inos are not food motivated. There's a lot of doodles out there that are not food motivated. And, and I have a ton of pet parents who'd be like, I literally spend my whole day just trying to get my dog to eat. We have to understand that some dogs live to eat and some dogs eat to live. And it's a lot harder when your dog just eats to live than living to eat, but they can do it. Some dogs though are motivated by other things. So if you're, if you've tried repeatedly different puzzle toys and different foods and different textures and adding peanut butter and things like that, and they're not into the food puzzle, that's totally cool. Maybe though they're into other types of toys. So maybe a Kong toy would be a better choice filled with something yummier than the texture that's in the food puzzle. Maybe your dog's into being brushed. Maybe your dog would be a great choice for massage. Maybe that's your bonding time. Um, there's, you know, I would love to at some point teach a quick home massage class on here because I think that's something that dogs really love and we love doing with our dogs. Maybe your dog wants to do nose work. There's a, if you're not familiar with nose work, there's a lot of great classes now for dogs to just innately do what they love to do, which is sniff and figuring out and being detectives and, and, and doing things that entice them to really innately enhance the sm the sense of their body that they do best. Um, so there's lots of different things that we can do to bring them enjoyment. And I get that's being having a dog that's not super food motivated can sometimes be pretty stressful for moms and dads. I've had one of those dogs. Um, that's a great time though, to talk to a care coach or your veterinarian and understand that that doesn't mean that your dog is weird or wrong or that you're doing something wrong. It just means your dog may have a different preference. And we just got to find it and explore it a little bit more because we can always find something to do and bond with our dogs. Um, we just have to remember that they're individuals and they have preferences too. And sometimes it just takes a little time to find that preference. So I hope that answered your question. And if anybody else has any other questions, please let me know. I'm happy to stick on for a little bit. Looks like we do have quite a few people who do want a massage webinar. So duly noted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the feedback. Yes. yes great to I know. totally feel you on the, the food motivated dog. I got my, my little schnauzer a while ago with food, um, the, the puzzle toy basically. And he just got, he just got so defeated just looking at it. It was so funny. Yeah. Um, but and yeah. sometimes that means we just start back a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I've had people start and they say like, I, I got this, you know, phenomenal $80 puzzle feeder off Amazon and my dog looked at it and just like walked away and walked out of the room. We need to start with just like a Dixie cup with food under it. Mm -hmm. So your dog just knocks it over and realizes it unveils some food, L literally that simple. And then you can work up to it. The whole point is for your dog to not literally just, you dump, a, you know, three days of food in a bowl and your dog's just laying there and it barely stands up and it's just eating and eating and eating and just blowing up into a tick and being very inactive. So there's lots of different ways that we can work up to those kind of puzzle toys, but it's okay if they don't want to. Yeah. Um, and um, Belinda just yeah. wrote and asked about um, keeping your dogs entertained if you work from home. Oh, I yes. think we can all relate to that <laughs> right now. Yes. Um, any tips for that? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So a couple things to remember. The first thing is, is, and we're guilty as parents of human children too, dogs do not have to be entertained every single second of the day. They do not have a need for instant gratification. And in fact, that's how we can create a risk factor for separation anxiety, because they feel that there's nothing else except for when you're with them. And unfortunately, a lot of separation anxiety has just sort of 
spontaneously happened through the pandemic because many of us, including me for several months here in Chicago, we were home quarantined and literally stuck next to them 24 seven. So really common for that to happen. And if you're still remote working right now, a couple things I would suggest. One is remember that dogs do need their space and it's healthy for them to have space and separation from you. So when you're getting ready to go on a Zoom call, that's a great time to get them set up with a puzzle toy or a Kong toy with frozen peanut butter or a frozen rope or something to get them excited about a distraction that's not you in a separate room. And when they're quiet and chewing on that, that's when we reward them with praise and love and let them be. Um, I think it's also very helpful for those dogs to have either crate time or separation time for them to sleep. Dogs actually sleep a, a lot more than we do. In fact, puppies can sleep 18 to 20 hours a day. And just like with babies, we don't want to wake sleeping puppies. That's when they're growing. So even though many of us do, because you look at a puppy and it's so cute and all I want to do is snuggle and love and kiss and you know, smother its face, um, we actually need to let them sleep. And it's the same way with adult dogs and especially with senior dogs who have a harder time sleeping, just like senior humans. Let them sleep. And if they're sleeping for three hours during the day, it's totally fine. But then when you need to get a break, because it's helpful, of course, when we're remote working and on the computer all day, when we need to get a little bit of fresh air, that's a great time to also take your dog out for fresh air. So puzzle feeders, enrichment toys, anything that we can freeze that your dog can work on for a long time, remembering that healthy separation is totally normal and actually wanted, and then making sure that we get those little quick bursts of exercise along the way. It's healthy for you too, to get out and get some fresh air. Definitely. And I just um, posted, Belinda, thank you for asking that question. Um, I've asked, I've asked Chrissy and other people on the team and Dr. Marks that question before too. So you're not the only one, oh. <laughs> um, but I was going to say with the Ask Pet membership, you get a membership to Pet Care RX. So if you're a member, um, we'll have Georgia send you some links to Pet Care RX toys. I just got my dog, this little green bone and it has little pockets in it. Um, it's like, you know, rubber and you put the little treats in the pockets and he just goes crazy for that. He loves it. So I think that might be a good one too. Yeah. There's a lot of puzzle, bo puzzle balls out there where you put treats in and as your dog bats the ball around, little treats fall out. So it takes time to empty and it's a great way to keep them distracted. Lots of different brands of that. Um, I want to make sure we get to Haley's question. I think it's a really interesting one and one that is actually more common than we think. And it's about dog happiness. She has a very vocal dog. He growls a lot and wags his tail at the same time. Would this mean he's upset or is growling when playing normal? That's a really interesting case, Haley. And as we just saw with the body language, it's very contradictory, right? Because um, if he's wagging his tail, that typically is a sign of happiness or at least excitement or engagement in whatever they're doing. The growling though, I guess I would have to get a better sense of what your dog's face and ears look like during that. Just like cats that purr, there are all different types of tones of vocalizations in dogs. So a lot of people are like, oh my, just, we'll just go cat for a minute. Sorry, I'll come back to dog. But with cats, when cats are purring, most people say, oh, my cat's purring is happy. It's absolutely not always true. Um, cats purr when they're in pain, they purr when they're scared, they purr when they're nervous, they purr when they're happy. It's just different types of purrs. So with dogs, vocalizations are also very different. So I think this is a perfect time to practice, Haley, your body language reading skills, is the next time your dog does this, we want to really look at all of the body at, as a whole. So our ears forward, are the eyes and face relaxed, right? The forehead is relaxed, not furrowed in a brow. What is the lip doing? If he's smiling and his mouth is relaxed and growling, or if he's curling, right? Curling the lips up, showing the teeth and furrowed brow. Is the body upright and relaxed or is he crouching down? And again, when we're wagging, when the growl comes, does he growl and then the tail tucks down and then goes back up and wags and then maybe motion makes your dog nervous and he growls and tail tucks down? It's a little bit more work that we have to do, but I'm happy to help you with it or your care coach or anyone else on the team. But I think we really need to get a little bit of either video or just really note what all those other parts of the body are doing so we can get a complete picture of what your dog really feels like in those moments. Um, but just remember, 
if everything else looks like I'm, I'm showing you signs of happy mom, it doesn't necessarily mean it's a growl. A lot of dogs will kind of, but that's sort of the best way I can describe it is sort of the dog version of a happy cat fur. They're, they're totally cool and they're playing and really happy. Um, it just sounds weird, right? It just, you're like, oh, I don't know if that's really a growl. Look at the rest of the body and then assess it. And like I said, we're happy to help you if, if you're still kind of like, I'm not really sure, but that, that, was, that would be what I would do. Awesome. Anybody else have questions? Happy to answer them. It looks like there's a, definitely a lot of people that have, have had that same concern too, right? It's if only we could we could really understand what they want to say. It would be great. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, if we don't have any other questions, I think. Um, thank you, Dr. Marks, for all the good info today. And thank you, everyone, for joining. Um, My pleasure. Stay tuned for the next webinar. Maybe we'll have to start with our next one being massage therapy <laughs> or anxiety or stress in dogs. That seems to be a big topic. So yeah. Um, again, thanks everyone for coming. Yeah. Well, we look forward to seeing you again. And there's my dog telling me to stop. <laughs> off. <laughs> well, great. And if, uh, before you leave, if there's a pressing topic on your mind and you're like, yeah, it's massage, but I really want to know about acupuncture, or I really want to know about blank, just throw it in the chat or send us a quick text or email. We'd love to hear it. Cause we really want to make sure that we're reaching all of you in the areas that you want to know about. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Take care. Have a great night. Bye.